we don't really think about it in the sense of what is my relationship to love personally as a state, you know, as something I can get to or be a part of, as opposed to I'm generating something from out of thin air. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. There's a, so many themes uh, that are in the book that I want to touch on, but maybe we can start here. So you write towards the beginning, um, a shark in a fish tank grows up to eight inches, but in the ocean, it will grow to eight feet or more. The shark will never outgrow its environment, and the same is true for you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your personal shark tank. You yeah. grew up in East LA, um, not exactly the hotbed of yoga and mindfulness, um, exactly. Um, and there is a there is a theory of structuralism that posits we don't shape the world; the world shapes us. So, how did East LA uh, shape you growing up? <sighs> God, that is such a deep question. I think I'm still unraveling the impact that growing up in in that environment had for me, especially as I get older and as I learn more about just myself and the world and structures and constructs and, and all of it. It's almost like I'm the... The continuous, um, I love the the continuity of self inquiry. So I'm constantly going back there, but it it definitely helps shape my view of the world. And at at a very young age, I understood what it was to have there be this cognitive dissonance of bad things happen out there in the world, not here, while bad things happened here, <laughs> just just outside <laughs> my door, right? I talk about being raised Catholic, so I'm, I always like to say I'm a recovering Catholic. Um, we had that belief system of be good, go to church, follow the rules, and life will be good. And I had these experiences of seeing families, largely immigrant families in the area that we grew up in was uh, this small housing project in East LA. And it was, when I was little, it was so much fun. I mean, there's a lot of kids and it, I akin it to being like Lord of the Flies. A lot of the time, I, I don't ever remember seeing adults for like from the ages of, I don't know, like four to six like, I just, I don't think I ever saw an adult. It was just kids everywhere all day, uh, which was really fun. And of course, as time went on, these kids grow, grew older. We began to see a lot of the disenfranchised youth get into trouble and sort of wreak havoc on, on the city. And I think seeing that experience, having the experience of, okay, but if I'm a good kid and, and everybody around me, all these aunts and mothers that come to our house to do these prayer circles are constantly praying, why do so many bad things keep happening, right? And, and trying and, and questioning, like as a child asking questions, but why does this happen? Or why did, you know, so-and-so's son get shot outside like what did she do you know it's always the question of what is going on it, it, i don't understand can somebody explain this to me and then being told like don't ask questions that's gonna get you in trouble with jesus you know <laughs> so yeah. you you're just sort of i understood deep in my being that there was something amiss like i just I knew, and somebody else had asked me that question before, how did you know that there was a disconnect between what you were being told and what was happening outside? It was because for me, the proof was there. The proof was externalized. I saw the, the chaos that was ripping through our neighborhood and the, the 
just tragic event after tragic event, the agony, the desperation of our neighbors, people I was growing up around, and I, it, it just wasn't computing. So that that's sort of what began that sort of the small acts of defiance. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, this innate desire to question and uh and then particularly in a religious context it's like don't question just keep your faith <laughs> you know <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> belief in the absence of evidence uh, just keep it it's okay <laughs> right. um and um there's a wonderful passage in the book um maybe you could describe it a little bit about um you taking communion oh. <laughs> and um <laughs> And uh, your urge to see the transcendental hand of God come down and, and touch the Holy Eucharist. But maybe you could just talk about it because it's so good. Yeah, this is one of those stories that I debated putting in. And I actually took it out at one point when I was writing the manuscript. And my editor was like, you have to put the story. You have to put it back in. It, it just explains so much, you know, with your curiosity and your desire to understand the world. So I was in catechism classes because I was told that I was going to do my first communion, right? Which is really hilarious when you think about it because doing these catechism classes, allegedly it's supposed to come from you. You have this internal desire to want to accept God into your life and learn and commit yourself to this way of life. And I'm like, I don't know that any kid understands that. But anyway, you're put through catechism classes at a very young age. So I was going to these classes and I had been in trouble before because I would ask too many questions. And I remember this particular instance, I was getting really close to the end. I think this was my second year. And my mom, I remember my mom had just had it with me. She says, do not get in trouble at catechism. If I get called in one more time, they're going to kick you out. And I just don't have the time to find a new church and a new, the whole thing. It was just do as you're told. Don't make any waves. Don't get in trouble. So I go in and this particular instance, this, uh, this class for for that particular Sunday, we were learning about the Eucharist. It was close to um, Easter. So I, I remember that vividly because we're heading into Palm Sunday and all the festivities that come during this time. And so we go in and we get the lecture that for that day and the nun is telling us, okay, this something very special is going to happen today. Um, we're learning where you guys are going to have the opportunity to sort of be in the know. I'm going to give you some information that is very special. And of course, all these children lean in and we're so excited. It's like, oh my goodness, this is what we're here to do. All of a sudden, I got really excited about what we we're about to see or experience. She starts to talk about the Eucharist and its importance and how during the service, we needed to look out to see the hand of God come down to touch. I kept calling it sacred wafer cookie. So it's like this <laughs> sort of like wafer that is the, the, the representation. And I don't mean to disparage or m make light to any of my Catholic brethren. So I say this with respect and love. But we're supposed to see this hand come down and touch the body of Christ. And... Uh, we're ha having this experience, this holy miracle experience. And because of our position and our belief system, we get to see it, right? And so I was very excited because we were getting this lecture and we're learning all about the Eucharist and it was during church service. So basically catechism classes began early in the morning. And then by the time the noon service happened, we were turned into our parents because our parents would come to that service and then we would we would uh come back to uh our class and then our parents would collect us once the service was done so we go during the eucharist we're sort of filed into the church to go experience this incredible miracle 
And I am so, my palms were sweaty. I was so excited. I was like, oh my goodness, this is it. This is why I come to church. This is, this is going to be the experience of a lifetime. And you have to remember too, the way that I grew up, we grew up watching Spanish news and Spanish um, TV. And so in a lot of these Spanish shows, there's a lot of these depictions and stories of miracles and people visiting these holy places of like the Virgin Mary showing up in like a tree or somebody's apartment window, right? So I'm believing that this is going to be one of those moments, right? We're about to get famous. So... <laughs> okay, here we go. So we're we're filing in. We go and we sit down with our respective parents. My dad's literally half asleep and my mom's just sitting there and I'm just looking at them both like wanting to tell them but also not because I want them to be shocked and in awe. So we're sitting there during said Eucharist. The priest raises the sacred wafer cookie and and does his um, blessing, and it happened instantly. And he he brought it back down, and all of a sudden, it just people start to file in to get the body and blood of Christ. They start to pass the Eucharist, and and I'm like looking around. I didn't see anything. There was no hand. I didn't see the hand. Right. So then I start to get nervous. I start to sort of blame myself. And think, oh, I would maybe I blinked, maybe I didn't keep my eyes open, like maybe it happened quickly, maybe it was a tiny hand. I could, I was trying to understand, and I'm looking around, and nobody's saying anything. It's just a typical service. After they are finished with the Eucharist, we're then filed away to go back to our catechism class. So we go and we get there, and everybody's sitting down, and the nun, she's so happy and ecstatic and all the kids are like just kind of talking and excitable and and then she starts to talk about how how many of you children how many of you guys saw the the hand of god come down to touch the eucharist every single one of them raised their hand every single one and i'm looking around and you know that moment where especially when you're a kid you don't want to feel left out you want to raise your hand too because i'm like oh yeah i saw it but I just felt like it had been so embedded in me to not lie, even though I was, right? There's the disconnect, right? So I, I had been a trained perjurer already at that age, but <laughs> I didn't want to lie in the house of God. I mean, even at that age, I, I needed to hold some sort of moral value, some sort of uh, integrity in my word. And so I didn't raise my hand and I, I thought about asking and I said, okay, I know if I'm going to ask, I know what she's going to say. She's going to get mad at me. I'm going to get kicked out and I'm going to get in trouble. But there was just something about this experience that didn't sit right with me. And so I raised my hand and I said, you know, excuse me, miss, like I didn't actually see the hand of God come down. And she said, oh, that means you're just not ready for God to come into your life. And then I was like, no, like that to me felt like the end because she's basically telling me that I have now been spurned by the church and God and I don't belong there. And I just was not into that. So I got up and I said, no, I didn't see it because there wasn't anything there. And when I said that, I wanted her <laughs> to explain to me that maybe it was a metaphorical hand, maybe it was the energy. I could understand that. I could get into that. Yeah, energetically, yes. God came down to bless the Eucharist, right? But it wasn't. It wasn't a metaphorical. She really meant the hand and and it didn't and I didn't see it. And I just fell in that moment of standing up that I can feel it viscerally in my body now at that age of like seven, eight years old. I just I, I couldn't do it. And I'm like, absolutely not. I will not lie. And there's something terribly wrong with somebody in authority telling me that okay. I'm wrong. Right. And so that, that was yeah. it. That was sort of the beginning of the beginning. <laughs> yes. And you committed blasphemy there for <laughs> yeah. the first time of many. Um, 
Well, and I think, you know, you do an amazing job in the book, kind of continually sort of pointing out these, um, how, well, my interpretation is that what became sort of a spiritual path for you was about questioning all of these kind of patriarchal, if you will, authority structures. Yeah. Um, and so kind of parallel to that scene, you're also pulling this thread through the first part of the book anyways, of being in front of uh, not a priest, but very similarly, a judge um, for stealing a cop car. <laughs> Rosie, what the hell? <laughs> it wasn't a, I have to be clear with people because this story has, for some reason, this is the one that people love to ask yeah. about and it's great. But I didn't steal it. I attempted. It was an attempted GTA, not a full on. I yes, don't think I'd I, be here you, if it was. that clear in the book. There's <laughs> never any depression of the accelerator. Right. It doesn't sound like. Um, <laughs> but de- nevertheless, it does um, land you in a, in, a, in a different kind of church, the church yeah. of law. And, um, and you're, again, judged by a male figure on a pedestal um, who's – at least in the Protestant church and, and a judge, they wear almost the exact same thing, which is yeah. interesting. Um, Catholic church is a little more colorful in their vestments. But um, but you have to then navigate this part of your life too. And um, But this judge does seem to throw you a bit of a lifeline. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that was big. So, you know, maybe give give us a little more color about some of the. I mean, not just the cop car incident, although that's a fun one to talk it about. So but you know, just your you know growing up the way you did. It was you know kids getting in trouble and smoking PCP and selling weed and all the yeah. rest. Yeah, yeah. This was par for the course. Everybody, this was just life. This wasn't oh. This is the bad kid. It was, no, we were all the kids. <laughs> all the kids. Yeah. I, I say this in the book, too, that every single one of my mom's friends had a their child or children involved in some sort of uh, legal issue. Every single one. There was some sort of something. So, it almost just felt like, for me, a matter of time, especially with the people I was hanging around. Um, and and the funny thing is that I didn't necessarily fall into the gang template, even though I did hang out with specific groups. It wasn't, I never luckily got involved in choosing one side or the other. And I think a lot of that had to do with how we moved around the city at that time and I had to sort of adapt to different neighborhoods that perhaps were a different, uh, you know, gang affiliated neighborhood. So I had to really learn, okay, what is the safest bet? Um, And I'm going back to sort of the way I navigated through because I think it's poignant to my foresight to learn how to navigate difficult situations or learning that there was always a third way, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you choose this or that. There's always that middle path, so to speak. And I, I think back to that time where my mom would get so angry about me just being like this punk rock kid, right? Because I'm like, okay, I'm not going to wear this color. I'm not going to wear that color because when I'm driving, when I'm going to school, I'm on the bus, I go to, to, you know, I get to school with these kids. And then when I get to school, I get to school with these other kids. So what is the safest bet? I'm like, Misfits t-shirt. I mean, that's always (laughs) going to be the safest bet. Just stick to just wearing black all the time and you'll be safe. Right? Yeah. So, well, yeah. No, go, go ahead. Well, I just, I, I harp a little bit on some of your experiences growing up because while they are unique to you, uh, I think 
a lot of people can see their own story in yours. And so many of us grow up quite literally being judged. Yes. You know, by God, by a magistrate in your case, um, by a, a yoga director that wouldn't give you that job or by our peers, you know, because we don't look a certain way or we don't fit a certain kind of body body type, etc. And from the get-go, we are literally me- made to feel guilty. Yes. Like guilty in the eyes of God, guilty in the eyes of the law, guilty that we are not enough in some fashion. Um, and this really, to me, always comes back to this patriarchal idea that there is a boss up there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and this really extends all the way down to kind of how we think about the world as sort of fabricated, you know, by this uh, cosmic carpenter, if you will. And, and you know, that <laughs> you're a ceramicist that blows, you know, the air into a, a clay figurine of Adam and, and gives it life. But, you know, we, we have this delusion that we are some form of product. And that product is either good enough or not quite good enough generally, yeah. and and that we are not a process of just emerging spontaneously moment to moment in, in every fashion. And, you know, this is a theme throughout your book of impermanence. Um, but I, I do, I think that, that the first half of the book really lays out the struggle yeah. that I think so many of us feel about being constantly judged. Yeah, I think absolutely. And I I don't know that I've, I've never had a conversation with anyone who didn't relate to that in some way, shape or form. And even now as I'm getting people who are reading the book and, and going through the, the practices or, or doing the journaling prompts, saying, I had a similar experience, or I remember what it was like to X, Y, and Z, sort of this conditioning of not enoughness, not being a certain way. And for some of us, it, it I mean, it, everyone, I think everyone can relate to that in some level. It's like if we weren't born into something, or if we look a certain way, or grew up on the I'm going to do like the wrong side of the tracks. You know, we feel like there's just no way of overcoming something. And and I'm just using those very basic broad descriptions, but but I think going back to, you know, when I start when I write about the pain and suffering, I'm like we're all equal before that wave. Every single one of us feels the same exact way. And so if there's a way for us to relate at that foundational level, as I weave that thread in of this is this is where that pivotal moment in my life where people say, how did you turn your life around or what happened? How did you make it out? How did you begin to believe that something was possible for yourself? That there was, that there was potential, that there was some something greater than what you had. And I always respond to the same thing. I People want to hear that. Oh, there was a small voice in me that said, Rosie, you're destined for greatness. And yeah. although that maybe resonated, I think I focused more on the fact that I accepted what was. I think that's where we have to start. Accept what is, as opposed to I have to concoct this very intricate plan to make my life happy. As opposed to, okay, where am I now? How can I accept that life is difficult and I will encounter challenges? How can I start from here? As opposed to, I'll wait until I get there and then I'll be happy or then I'll, I'll find that elusive success. And what is success anyway? Which I think is fascinating in this whole experience, right? People are like, wow, Rosie, you made it through. You grew up in this really chaotic environment. You survived like drive-by shootings and you saw somebody get stabbed and you lived through this incredibly chaotic 
childhood? How did you get to here? And and I feel like okay, those those seem really uh, Hollywood noteworthy right now. <laughs> They're yeah. just very like this is an interesting story. But I think it, every single one of us has that interesting story. I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, just because maybe you didn't get arrested and and have that judge <laughs> grant yeah. you that that opportunity, that there is still on some deep level, something that led you to be on that middle path where you didn't have to choose this or that. And you were able to cultivate that deep sense of resilience within yourself. Right. Mm, So I feel like one of my superpowers has always been an ability to relate to everyone in some way, shape or form. There's some commonality. And I think that's where Radically Loved was born from, from that belief. That was the core belief. People are like, oh, did you have this unwavering faith in yourself? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. I still don't, you know. But what I do believe is that there is this cosmic carpentry. I love that you said that. But there is this force within each of us. Call it resilience. Call it the divine, call it the ultimate equalizer, whatever it is that you want to call it, that creates that internal anchoring of support within yourself. Mm. Because we're the ones that have to walk through that threshold of the fire of transformation. You don't have to walk it for me, right? I don't have to walk it for you. We have to walk it for ourselves. Right. Yeah. And or run a marathon through driving pouring rain. Yeah. <laughs> and you're not just walk through fire. Um, I mean, I, you were fortunate in so far that you had a sister that seemed to be at least dabbling in yoga. I don't know yeah. how deeply she went into yoga, but it seemed like she did um, introduce um, the practice to you. And it, you talk a little bit in the book about how you started to go to yoga class, um, but it wasn't kind of you weren't the typical person going to a, a you know a, a studio in yeah. West Hollywood, and um, you paint this portrait of, of going kind of incognito in the back of the room with the big hoodie pulled <laughs> up, um, and then um, one thing that. It kind of stuck with me is that you would bolt uh, as soon as Shavasana started, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is ballsy, but you might not have even realized how ballsy it was. But right. um, so for those who aren't regular yoga practitioners, Shavasana is uh, also known as corpse pose often ha- happens at the end of uh, asana practice as a sort of relaxation pose, if you will. But you're generally, um, counted on to, to, to stick that part out because in a way it's sort of the payoff it's right it's wonderful it's actually the w- most wonderful experience you could have yeah um but finally one day you stayed um for shavasana and um you capture this moment really beautifully in the book and i, I wonder if i could ask you to to read a little section i don't know if you have it yeah handy. yeah um, i'd love to I have it handy right here. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> so so this was uh, when a compassionate teacher kind of set you up um, and you stuck out the Shavasana. Yeah. Take this it, was, take this was the first encounter and it happened right at the perfect moment as I believe a lot of instances like this do. I could feel my breath deepening as I listened to the sounds of Tibetan bulls in the distance. I thought of the moment when I was a child and heard my first drive-by shooting, watching my belly rise and fall. I felt my body contracting again. Just breathe, I told myself. You're okay. I let my arms release, felt my upper body soften, and felt like my entire body was moving deeper into the ground. I felt a trickle of water move down the side of my cheek, then another, then another. I opened my eyes as they welled up with salt water. I could see a palm tree through the short and narrow window above the Buddha shrine. I let the tears stream down the side of my face. 
Moments later, I emerged and made my way to my car, feeling a deep sadness. Time was passing. My life was a current, a quick flowing river. I was a spectator, idly watching as the stream flowed to different places, hurried and without direction. I spent so much time worrying about what everyone else was doing that I hadn't stopped to think for myself. I had created unhealthy impressions, although not all of them were negative. The ones I let live in my mind needed to go. The promise of yoga and meditation is to make the unconscious conscious. It's bringing to light the mounds that lie below the surface. When you experience moments that leave deep impressions, you don't need to dissect them. You don't need to figure out how or why they worked. They worked. That's enough to move forward. The moments that shape your life, moments of trust, doubt, peace, uncertainty, they all lead you to wisdom, which in turn leads you to healing. You gain a deeper knowledge to discern the journey to your own unique spiritual center. You are forged in the fire and shaped by your adversity. This journey is the path you need to take to become the person you are meant to be, unapologetically and radically you. Mm. So beautiful. Thanks for reading that. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, this landed with me profoundly. Um, there are three different threads uh, within that passage that um, echoed uh, in me. So the promise of yoga and meditation is to make the unconscious conscious. Um, so not everyone who's listening or watching um, is a yoga practitioner necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but I think everyone can put their thumb on some moment uh, in their life when there was a, a light that was shined onto the shadows. You know, that, that there's this notion in spirituality of flood-like flood -like consciousness versus spotlight consciousness, that most of the time we're going through light, life as if we're driving a car with these very narrow, you know, head beams, and we just kind of see what's right in front of us, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the task. But to turn on the floodlights and to go down into that dingy basement of your soul and confront all that trauma among the spiders <laughs> it's, it's um ah oh, it's like both epiphanous and scary but i mean that's what that's what the that's what growing is right i just felt like that was such a right on hmm. statement <laughs> oh good yeah, this is, I, I'm curious for you too, the, I, I love that you saw the, there's a lot of double meaning throughout the book. Hmm. And I think that for, for the people that are into that type of Easter egg hunt, there's a lot <laughs> in the book. There's actually a lot of really fun sort of callbacks that if you're paying attention, you'll, you'll get, right? And that to me is just fun. I love reading books that way. So I, I wanted to write a book in that fashion. And I, and I love that you, you got that sort of double meaning. Um, I'm curious with regard to that seeing of life passing, if that brought anything up for you as well. Yeah. Well, the other piece within that passage, when you're talking about work, you know, um, about being in the current of being in life's river. Um, I mean, we're all in it. There, there's no way out of it. You know, you're in the Tao. Sorry. Uh, you can't not be. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, the challenge becomes how skillfully we can navigate uh, that river that we're in. And are we, are we going to swim upstream and, and tire ourselves out? Are we going to be tossed around by the current? Uh, or, you know, are we going to refine the ability to sort of expertly apply that little rudder 
mm-hmm. and and use the force of the river for our own benefit? Are we going to move with the grain of the wood or, you know, the Tao uses all of these amazing um metaphors the the markings in jade or the striations in muscle you know to move in accordance with nature and um and to see yourself in that river uh and eventually be the river um and uh you know this is a um you know something that i'm trying to apply to my own life always this notion of, of Wu Wei, of mm. never forcing, of, of, and it shouldn't be confused with, with lack of ambition. You know, I'm plenty ambitious, really, but um, to not have any attachment to the result of my ambition. Mm. And, um, and so to let go of product just blow it out and just be full process. Um, that's living with the water's course. That's living with the Tao, seeing the Tao and living with the foundational intelligence of the universe. Hard to do every day in yeah. and out because I have this thing called an ego <laughs> that's constantly like uh-huh. defining myself through other people's eyes and what I have and my role in society and the plaque on my desk or whatever. I don't have a plaque on my desk, but you know what I mean. Um, so that, you know, there's that in there. And then uh, I guess the, the other big piece that, re- that really rang true for me was um, adversity. Mm. Um, I just did this uh, little mini course, my first course on stoicism. So there's, I have a lot of stoic aphorisms on yes. my tongue. There's, uh, there's one of Seneca, who is one of the great um, stoics. He said, no man is more unhappy than he who never faces adversity, or he is not permitted to prove himself. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is how, you know, the the physiological immune system grows through, um, through, you know, low grade contact with stress and toxins and bacteria and virus. And we build up resiliency. Same thing with our psychological immune system. You know, we process insult and ad hominem and all this in input coming at us uh, day to day. And, you know, if we are practicing some degree of stoicism or some spiritual path, then, then we build our own psychological immune system, um, that way. And it's funny, you know, you, you, you talk, there's, there's another piece of the book that I loved, um, where you talk about character. Oh yeah. I love that. And you say, um, kind of this notion that everyone has a special sauce. Um, Mm -hmm. and I want to ask you what your special sauce is, but you wrote something, um, where you said, I am drawn to flaws because they make something unique. Um, and that immediately made me think of like Kintsugi art. Yeah. Um, this, uh, it's a art form that uh, often uses molten gold to reassemble broken pottery or tea caddies or whatever in, in Japan anyways. And the, uh, but it's an art form itself. And you look at the, the bowl that has been reassembled and what they call the, uh, they call the, the broken areas that have come back together. They call them precious scars. So beautiful. And that there's this kind of asymmetrical order that is much more a reflection of nature than like these perfectly symmetrical Greco-Roman buildings and things like that. Anyways, so I loved all that. That was really fun. I feel like I'm just giving you like an- No, uh, that's great. Uh, I love uh, it. It's so good. Moment to moment online- uh, uh, Review. Uh, review, yeah. I love it. Um, it's great. No, it's so, but, I mean, it's interesting yeah. to hear how any of these pieces resonate with people. And so it, it that was my ultimate desire was to- the the entire book it, it's an invitation for the reader to write their own story to go into their own radical truths to cultivate their own deep level of 
radical love and uh, presence, resilience, um, giving tools to learn how to navigate through life's challenges. I mean, that it, it's an invitation for for everyone. And so I, I love people taking that invitation. Obviously, you did. And so that <laughs> just makes me so happy because that was the intention behind it. What's your secret sauce? Mm. I'll oh, answer man. after you do. Okay. I thought about this a little bit. So I think my, my, my secret sauce is also, or my strength, I would say, is also my kryptonite, to be honest. They're one and the same thing. So I had a very different upbringing than you did, but I had some s- similar aspects to it where I spent um, my first seven or eight years moving from international city to international city, basically. And I was going to new schools every six months and, uh, you know, with having to assimilate into new cultures with a new language. And, um, and I was also quite chubby as a kid. So I basically spent my first eight years, more or less, just trying to fit in, you know. And as a kid, obviously, that, is, that exists in stark relief. And um, it took me 50 years, 51 years to figure out the delineation between fitting in and belonging. Um, but I deeply internalized uh, and understand the need for belonging. And mm. so the thread of my whole life has been trying to facilitate and foster community and connection because mm-hmm. that is also the part of me that was my Achilles heel. So. You know, I feel like that is going to be the truth across the board for people answering that question, because I feel like it is for me, as you said that I, my secret sauce is the same. It's too much of a good thing, right? It's a great uh, characteristic to have, but also it's what gets me in trouble half of the time. I'm a, I'm a great listener. I am just, I I know that that's part that's always been, I can sit and actually listen and be with, I know how to be with somebody. I know how to hold their hand and just listen and be fully immersed into another person. It it makes me, it brings me joy. I just, I love it. I love giving people that energy, that full undivided attention. Um, And the reason why it becomes my kryptonite is because I'm also very, I can potentially be very easily persuaded, you know? So I think in that Mm -hmm. transference of energy, I can also become so malleable to somebody's, you know, I can become a victim really quickly <laughs> of somebody somebody convincing me of something. I mean, there are certain things that look, I believe what I believe and I I'm very an open-minded person, but I'm I'm also I and I prove it right throughout my ch- childhood and even teenage years, I'm I'm easily persuaded. You know, I just mm. am because I want I'm a people pleaser. I want to make people happy, you know. Yeah. So let me comment on this because I was thinking about it in this context of, you know, people pleasers get um, get a very bad rap and, you know, you need to set boundaries, right? Yes. And uh, you need to be your authentic self. Yes. And that's the difference between fitting in and belonging. Fitting in is, you know, y- your ability to change who you are in order to be accepted within a group and belonging is being accepted while also retaining your authentic self okay okay i can buy that to some degree but at the same time and people who listen to this podcast will may have a chuckle about this is that because i embrace myself as a process uh as a series of constantly moving parts spontaneously sort of arising that i will often take um because I want to fit in or belong that I will often like take on somebody else's accent within like five seconds. And so I've interviewed Matthew McConaughey on this show and I I have a Southern drawl when I do it. It's so embarrassing, you know, (laughs) or, um, uh, I've, um, 
or I, you know, with Russell Brand, I'll, I'll start, start speaking like an Englishman or with even with Wim Hof, I started talking like a Dutch guy, like you have to get into the ice bath and take the breath, you know, and my wife is just, and my kids are actually, are absolutely horrified, but I'm not doing it consciously. I'm not doing it like, oh, I better take on this inflection because I want to fit in. Right. I'm really just, I'm just dancing. Yeah. In the relationship and picking up on little cues and little inflections and little body movements. And, you know, and I think part of that is because I've been, I was so trained as a kid. Yes. I was to, just going to say that. Yeah. To basically yeah. take on the language of wherever I happened to land with my parents, you know, yeah. that month. And so, anyway, so, the, you know, people pleasing. Yeah, you know, obviously there's a point at which you need to set boundaries, but I also think there's something to around people pleasers that can be very, I guess, emotionally intelligent. And, you know, yeah. Malcolm Gladwell talks about that in one of his books where, you know, conversationalists have this dance and, you know, what you're really doing is dancing with someone and you're just finding ways to connect, finding ways in because there is this deep intrinsic desire to belong and connect. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's not all bad. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I mean, I, I agree with you and I, I love that you said that because I, it totally makes sense to me that you're taking on Tori does the same thing. My partner, mm -hmm. he does the same yeah. thing with his English friends or if they're, because he was an international student. So there's that thing that you have to sort of adapt and you're listening to, you're queuing in, you're listening and you're trying to connect. And so I think it's an instinctive thing that happens. And I, I think it's really sweet, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe you need to give them a little bit more context so they give you a break. Yeah. I mean, there was one time <laughs> in New York when I got into the cab and we had a Jamaican cab driver. And I mean, it's so embarrassing. I can't even really believe I'm saying this. But, you know, I immediately I'm like, take us up town, man. <laughs> and my kids are like, what the heck, dad? What are you doing? And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I just, you know, the cab driver's looking at me pathetically. <laughs> Anyways, um, moving on. Yeah. Um, so, um, there are, so there's a couple of other themes that, oh, actually, I want to stay with one thing around resilience and, yes. and adversity for a second because, like um, it. uh, there is a section of the book where you talk about running the LA marathon. And I wonder if you could just spend a little time and hover over that particular experience. Yeah, that was a intense moment for me, I think, because I believe in impermanence. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I know that the only thing constant in life is change. And so having all of these tools didn't matter when you get to, you know, the ego takes over. So as you were talking about the ego earlier, I was thinking about my desire to run this marathon and my sort of like illusions of becoming this ultra marathoner that was going to run Boston and, and great dreams to have. And I, I still run and it's one of my passions that I, I do enjoy very much. Um, but this particular marathon, I was really into the body portion of my spiritual practice. And I really felt that getting to this place of, oh, I survived growing up in East LA. I didn't go to jail. I'm sort of creating this life that from the outside, somebody could say, oh, this is a success story of one of these sort of at-risk kids growing up and getting a job, going to college and creating this life, right? But for me, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to just have this facade of this life that seemed happy because I still wasn't happy. And I was starting to get to that place where I was feeling a little bit like, at what point does life get easier? 
right? At what point does it get easier? And oh, it'll get easier once I complete all of my goals. Once I get there, when once I cross that finish line, that elusive happiness will be, as you said earlier, the flood of joy and ecstasy will just completely take over my life and I will ascend and be enlightened. And like <laughs> That will be my life. And I wasn't doing, it was almost like I got to the point during my spiritual path where the only thing left to excavate was the things that I had put in the closet buried underneath the basement, like far away. I didn't want to dig into those parts of myself that I knew needed to come to the surface. And so I just decided to accumulate um, tasks and and these goals, running a marathon or, or building something new, just distractions. So I, I wanted to I'd been told that I wasn't a runner and and this actually didn't make it into the book, but I'm talking about a friend of mine who was a trainer who sort of like was the invitation to run. But the part that got cut out was the fact that somebody else had told me that I, I probably couldn't do it, that I wasn't a runner type, meaning that my body was not a runner body. And so, because I'd already had so much judgment and disdain over it, I just felt like proving everybody wrong. And so, as any A-type or perfectionist uh, identified person would do, you have to go extra, right? So, it's not, it's not only I'm going to become a runner. I'm going to run the marathon. And not only am I going to run the marathon, I'm going to run the Boston marathon, right? So, I figured out how to do that and I I started training and treating my body just as a machine. Like I went from instead of nurturing myself in a loving way and and getting to know my body in a deeper way, I realized that this was a vessel and it was a machine and so it could do what I wanted it to do when I wanted it to do it. So I started training and here's this pinnacle of what is going to equate to my happiness. And in, in the book, there's a parallel story going on of this life that I'm living, this sort of from the outside successful life. And it just, it was vacant. It, there was no substance for me. Something was missing. And I thought that this was it. And so I get to marathon day, uh, which I, I detail because there was so much going on. This external storm was sort of a great metaphor for the internal storm that was brewing within me and getting to this place of training for years and having this this goal um, sort of fall apart before my eyes and really literally fall apart <laughs> just outside. We were going through this torrential storm that I talk about as well, how we never get storms like that in Los Angeles. And of course, that day, it was one of the worst storms in in, in our history at that point. And it's interesting because as I'm going through the motions of getting to race day and I'm talking about preparing and sort of my mantra, slow and steady wins the race, like this whole idea that this was somehow a race that was needing to be won, that I needed to get to that elusive peak, that summit of the mountain. And I was ready. I'm like, I survived everything. This gave me the grit. I can do this. This is going to be easy. I've survived harder things. And um, giving away the entire story. I mean, I, 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 do, I don't make the time. Obviously, I, I didn't. And everything kind of starts falling apart towards the end. And I start to have this realization that all of, all of those externalized um, goals that I had set for myself that I had reached still weren't cultivating that deep level of happiness that I was wanting to feel because I wasn't doing the healing that I needed to do. I wasn't going into that state of embodiment that I knew was part of this 
practice, was part of yoga, was part of all of the contemplative teachings that I was learning about. It was the part that I would skip over. And it's like, no, 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 I don't need to do that. I don't need to feel that. I don't need to go back there. I survived that. We don't dwell in the past here. We move forward. We live our life in the present moment. We sort of bypass those unsavory experiences and we just keep pushing, right? So that was the moment where my body just sort of had that same experience after that first Shavasana. So it was like after that Shavasana, that first experience of my body sort of releasing that physiological response of, oh, this is what relaxation feels like, or this is what my, this is what my body at ease feels like. The second step to that was putting my body through this rigorous experience to sort of shake things out in a way to move all of what lied at the surface to the surface and allowing me to have this experience of, okay, why are you here? Why are you doing this? You know, how are you going to feel knowing that this elusive, this goal that you had set is not going to happen? What happens to you now? How do you treat yourself now? Right? Yeah. So good. Um, so many things to pull on there. I think there's this question of why run the marathon? So for me, and I'm using this kind of metaphorically. Yeah. Is it the finish line? you know, the time, so then I can get to this next thing. It's the external goal instead of I'm just running to run. And, and I always joke with my brother, um, who's a musician, I'm like, you know, I'm like, Eric, you're the, you're the great Buddha uh, because you play the song. You don't play the song to finish it. You know, otherwise the the best musician would be the fastest musician. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> right. you, know? you play it to actually play the song. Or dancers, my daughters are dancers. You know, I, um, they dance not to finish the routine. They dance to dance. And um, you know, the second that we just become completely fixated on getting there, yeah. then life becomes this dismal errand. <laughs> Yeah. And um and so you know now you know like for example in terms of my like movement practices aside from my clunky little yoga practice like I play a lot of tennis. I grew up playing competitive tennis. I'm still I think I'm 25. But you know I don't go to play tennis to finish the match. I go to play. And most of the time I don't want to finish because I'm having such a good time. <laughs> you know yeah because it i'm utterly present there and it may be just for chasing around meaningless yellow fuzzy balls um but i am experiencing a, a sense of cognitive absence and when i'm really there when i'm fully fully there i am marrying intention and action mm -hmm. and that is flow you know, that is flow yeah. state. And um, so I was thinking about you running and there you are in this, in what could be this place of flow, but your drishti is out there on the finish line always. Yeah. But that finish line, there's always another one. Yeah. <laughs> there's always another finish line. That's the hedonic treadmill. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and anyways, I just, the way yeah, you no, it I, is I love it. I think it's, it, as you're saying that, I mean, there is no there, there, right? There yeah. is no there, there. That's, that's the point. And I love that you bring that up because it, there's that elusive idea that we have of what creates that flow state, that moment that we crave. And I feel like the less we try to create those moments and instead just focus on the moments moment per moment we can we can get more into that flow state in that state of in integration I, I feel the same way when we do karaoke right i love karaoke and one of my friends was asking oh well 
So like, what is the goal? Like, what is the goal that you're wanting to get to? Because we we started get singing less. I mean, we're just really into it. And to me, it's it's just fun. It's it's just fun to do it. We get lost into doing it. We're seeing all kinds of genres. We just get really, it's fun. It's fun for us to be immersed in that experience of joy and nostalgia when we're singing old songs, you know, like we'll put on the entire Alice in Chains catalog and we'll just like <laughs> sing every single song. It, it's having that experience that you're talking about when you play tennis, you, you're doing it to do it, to have the experience of that integration. Yeah. And in there, there can be moments of just ease, Yeah, you know? And um, I was wondering, actually, this could be a good time to read another section because there is this opening paragraph of the last chapter of the book, um, which is, I believe, You Are Radically Loved, is uh, eponymous with the title of the book. Um, that kind of describes, it gives a little glimpse into the Satori of the other side. Yes. Um, um, and this is actually uh, one of my, my favorite chapter, uh, personally. Uh, it's You Are Radically Loved. Uh, the radical truth is the moments that are good and true are signs of the divine. And it begins like this. One morning during my meditation, I was overwhelmed by a deep sense of comfort. There was nothing complex about what I was doing. I was just listening to the sounds of the birds outside of my window, when suddenly I sensed a gentle wave of peace. I was relaxed. I wasn't engaging in anything other than what was happening in my body. I took a deep breath, which my body held comfortably. I wasn't compelled to make lists or analyze my latest Netflix binge. There was no tension, no pain. Then in one second, my blissful moment was abruptly interrupted by my desire to laugh. I began to think of my to-do lists, and I engaged with the normal narratives that came and went. I need to go to the grocery store. And I should do nothing and stay in bed all day. The mind wants to be anywhere but in the present moment. Do you know why we can't stay in that blissful moment all the time? Because change is inevitable and everything is impermanent. We practice because we forget and practice is essential. Mm, Thank you. Thanks for reading that. We practice because we forget. This is a theme that you come back to um, time and again in the book. And, you know, those of us who are trying to, you know, have this examined life and um, we get glimpses of ease and of presence. And then back we're, that, back we're there in the chatterbox of our mind that, you know, if the chatterbox was amplified out our ears, you know, people would commit us to, a, you know, it send us to the loony bin. Yeah. And that applies to everybody. Um, and, it, I, and then this notion of practicing because we forget it's it sort of gave me a nice permission to be like, oh yeah, okay, right. This is why I do this. This is why we come back to this every day, and um, and it's okay to forget. You know, that's just kind of naturally the human condition is impermanence. I'm not going to be in this state of bliss every moment. Um, anyways, I thought this was a particularly poignant. Yeah. Passage. Yeah, no, we have this desire for finality constantly. We we like to know where things go. We like to create categories and boxes and organize and I I I part of our journey especially to healing it, it doesn't move. It's not a linear experience. It it goes through cycles and waves and it doesn't always go 
on the current of a sprint. Sometimes it's a marathon. And I always like to tell people that I'm, I'm a marathon runner. I, I love the long process and I don't always enjoy it things taking a long time, but I know that that's, that's always what is going to create a, a deeper reverence to an experience or something that I'm trying to create. I, I also write that something worth having is worth waiting for. And if you want something to stand the test of time, it's going to take some time. And, and I know that and I can rest in that, especially in a world of instant gratification and wanting to get from point A to point B in a hurried and quick way. And not to say I don't have, I mean, the ego wants what it wants, right? I want this to be an instant success. I want things to happen quickly. But I know in my heart that that is, it's not sustainable. And I much rather live in a sustainable state of constant and continuous healing rather than to do something that I know isn't going to last long. Yeah. Okay. So here's a toughie. Here's a tough question. Um, and this was one that I was asking myself throughout the course of reading the book, which is what does it really mean to be radically loved? Mm -hmm. And I'll let you take a crack at it first. Yeah. I have my own thoughts about it. Yeah. You know, it's definitely a question I've been asked a lot. Uh, yeah. And I, I say this in every interview that I've done. I, I try to answer it differently every time because I don't know that there is a specific answer to it. I can give you my definition of what that means, but I feel like it's like the process of healing. It's it's an experience that one has to define and decide for themselves what that anchoring feels like. And if I had to describe what it means or what it is, I think the meaning is simple, is to feel um, an unwavering, depth of support and compassion uh, and grace within yourself. What is it, what is it, what does it look like in your life? What does it feel like in your life? It feels, it feels like an opening. It feels like an opening because I feel like so much of our healing journey for the people that have gone through adversity of any kind, the instinct is to retract and to contract, to recoil and move away from everything and everyone at times. It's like what the little clam does right in its shell it, i'm a cancer right so it's like it just retracts itself into its safe safety its shelter um but i think that radical love is the internal anchoring of knowing that if you extend your hands or your little cancer palms out that it's it's gonna be okay and that you're gonna be safe and you're compelled to continue on your journey. I mean, I know that's a long answer, but. Yeah, well, I mean, if it wasn't a long answer, I'd be concerned because <laughs> uh, if there was a short answer, there wouldn't be 10,000 books in the bookstore about it, <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> We're trying to, you know, unpack the foundational essence of love here. Um, and, uh, I interviewed this rabbi a few months ago and he, think, he said, you know, when we try to define things like love, it's like putting together the shattered mind of God. Mm. I'm like, well, 
I was like, that's pretty good. Wow. But that, that, you know, Plato went through this process, you know, okay, we can turn around and see the light and not just the shadow of the thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we spend our whole lives, if we're trying to examine them, trying to, you know, use words as semiotics, as symbols to put constructs on top of sensation. Yeah. <laughs> so it's hard. Um, I mean, you could talk about relational love. I'm actually starting to write. Um, I'm, a, I'm the justice of the peace at my brother's wedding is coming up, and I have to say something about love. But, um, you know, it, love starts like, oh, you know, he's hot or whatever. And then it goes kind of from there. It's like, oh, but I really like her personality, you know, and this is relational love. But then, you know, it goes conditional. It's like, okay, I love you if you X right. fill in the blank. And then there's transactional love. It's right. like, yeah, I love you, but you got to pick up the kids at five or whatever. And, you know, it, we keep getting closer and closer as if we're like climbing up this endless ladder towards the mind of God or towards ultimate source of true love, you know, with a capital L. And, um, you know, so when I start to think of the moments in my own life where I'm the most expansive and I'm the most effusive, um, where I'm not just loved, but I'm also loving, mm -hmm. And that there is only a sense of connection and non-separateness there. So the best way, you know, I can put my thumb on it is like um, there's this idea of um, in Buddhism called Brahma Vihara, which is the four abodes of the Brahman, but basically the states of being that arise from samadhi, from full integrated consciousness meditation, mm -hmm. kind of when you're just all there completely just all there and um so that so i started to think about love not just kind of as an emotion in the roomy sense of like oh it visits your house sometimes it's invited sometimes it's not it kind of sneaks out the back door and you're the house you know whatever and there's jealousy comes in and jealousy leaves and envy comes in and envy leaves and uh, love's at the table too that's sort of love as a uh, emotional phenomena arising and subsiding in consciousness moment to moment. But think, but I started thinking about love as a, as more of a state of being of it, of like, it's not in you, you're in it. <laughs> like mm -hmm. a state of being like, it could be Wyoming or Colorado, like you're in the state of it. <laughs> and, um, and in with Brahma Vihara, that's, that's, so it's karuna, the identification of someone else's suffering as your own or compassion. Um, mudita, like empathetic joy. So joy for someone else's joy. Like your joy, Rosie, registers as my joy. <laughs> you know, um, Or metta, the sort of unconditional thrusting of loving kindness and goodwill for all. And then there's kind of a strange one, the yupeka, or I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's sort of equanimity, which is love without attachment. So love kind of that emerges in the absence of need where it can just be given and I don't need anything back. And so this, those are the qualities that have somehow started to color this state of being for me, which at my best, I can go visit that state and be inside of love. And uh, but <laughs> it's a state I don't always have a visa to enter. <laughs> yeah, I mean it. God, that's so it's so beautiful, and I I love uh, that you described those those four essences or ways because I feel like. For me, it was the latter, right? The last one where it's just being in the state without having the attachment that to me is the ultimate way of doing it, right? Because I'm not, there's that sense of, uh, you know, I have something 
and I can give it to you. But if I decide not to give it to you, therefore it's going to stay with me. And I just, I, it's that conditional part of our relationship experience that I feel like a lot of the times people judge love based on that. You know, my ability mm -hmm. to give love to others conditionally or to receive love from others that we don't really think about it in the sense of what is my relationship to love personally uh, as a state, you know, as something yeah. I can get to or be a part of as opposed to I'm generating something from out of thin air as opposed to something that's resonating and has been here way before us and will be here way way after us right mm, yeah so yeah I mean I, I think it's a deep philosophical question and I think that it's the way I see it it's the reason why there's so much um, ocean iconography throughout the book. You know, these references to water and movement and currents and waves. Because I've, I, how do you describe, how do you describe the ocean to somebody who's never seen it or experienced it? Yeah. Are you asking me? It, well, no, I'm just saying in general, you're like, yes, I can. Here, here <laughs> well, it goes. No, it, it's hard. I mean, right? Yeah. It's, it's vast and seemingly all encompassing. Yeah. And, and I love what yeah. you said in the beginning, too, of us utilizing this English language, this construct to describe experiences that we have especially experience of of joy or or love or ecstasy or whatever it may be it, you you know different languages you know there's different words for different these same things could have different words and different meanings and i feel like the current, the desire that we have to understand each other is only the beginning right this book is is a big book of questions, right? This is like, this is, this is what my experience has been. This is what has worked for me. Maybe some of these tools will work for you. And if they don't work for you, you're on the path. So congratulations either way, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and just as a manner of, structural organization i mean you're offering journal prompts throughout the course of the book so um and so you're really inviting people to then bring themselves to the ideas that you've presented but knowing that those ideas are going to be completely unique and and different you might have you know put out the ingredients and everyone's going to make a different dish now. And that's the amazing thing about writing. Yeah. And I mean, you wrote the book when you, you probably shared it with a few people as you were writing it, but essentially like when you wrote the book, it was one book. Now it's tens of thousands of books because everybody brings their own unique experience to the reading of the book, including me, as you can tell. And so and that's the amazing thing about using energy, which is what you are, animated information, which is what you're providing, in connection. And so it's just like having a baby, basically. It's just like, I'm going to share some genes, you're going to share some genes, and nature's going to select for the best of it, and we're going to mix it all up, and we're going to you know, produce something. I mean, that's what you're doing. You're saying, here's some information, here's some ideas, and now nature's going to mix it all up. The world, you know, however many books that you sell, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, a million, is going to mix it all up, and everyone's going to take some of those ideas and mix it up with what they bring to it, and nature will then select for the next best idea. <laughs> you know, yeah. and this is, and it's so cool because it's not your book anymore. Sorry. <laughs> it's like everybody else's book. Yeah, no, um, it's true. 
And, um, and I'm, you know, this is, it's also the fascinating part of releasing a book and you're right at the front end of it, but you're going to get like people that are going to come back to you and you're like, well, that's not really what I meant. And they're like, well, I don't give a shit what you meant. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> this is the, this is the chord it struck with me. This is how yeah. I feel about love, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, and, uh, but this is part of the great dialogue and, you know, I'm so caught up on Buddhism these days and like, but you know, one thing I love about Buddhism is that it is a dialectic. Mm -hmm. It's not like the final word of God, you know, and live up to it or, you know, off you go to eternal blazes. It's like, here's the Sangha and we're in fellowship and we're going to have dialogue such that, that nature can select for the better incarnation of it for the delegated adaptability of the ideas you know this is the great juice of it all and so yeah that's why writing is so uh amazing and and what you're doing is such a gift oh thanks that's so nice yeah. that that's my hope you know is to have it's almost like yeah this is great where's everybody else's book i want to read everybody else's <laughs> story <laughs> you know i'm i'm so curious to hear how, yeah, I want people to tell me what my book's about. You know what I mean? I want people to say, this is what, you, this, is what this meant, right? How they, <laughs> yeah. that's, I can't wait for the day where people start like, to tell me the stories. Yeah, like when you were running that marathon, you weren't really trying to get to the finish line. You never wanted to go to Boston, girl. Yeah. I know it. <laughs> um, oh my God, it's so true. Yeah, I will say, um, there's also just a great bit of humor in the book. And there's a, there's a little section at the beginning that was, a, for me, a springboard into reading the rest of the book. And I was like, oh, this is going to be enjoyable because it's also going to be funny. Um, where you talk about, I think it was the garage and your uncle was living out in the garage or oh, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And, um, and you made this one little leap. I'm not sure anyone else thinks it's funny, but I do, where you talk about the collage of images on the wall. And there's like a Guns N' Roses poster and like a Doors poster and like a pennant for the Raiders. And then there's like some tear outs of like hot girls and bathing suits and things like that. And um, I think you said something like, I might later refer to this as an unconscious effort to build a vision board. <laughs> <laughs> that was so funny. So good. I was, uh, just kept going back to that and laughing. Oh, I'm so glad that that landed, you know. <laughs> it, it was yeah. one of these interesting things where the first pass of this book, the original, was so prescriptive and so serious that it didn't feel like me. It, it just it didn't feel – it felt like I wrote this book on this topic – and it just didn't feel natural. It felt very forced. And when I went back to the drawing board and I was talking with my editor uh, and I was saying that I this didn't feel complete. It felt like it was missing some some me, you know, some of my just I'm I like joking. I like laughing. I, I think things are funny. You know, I think it's important to be able to laugh at yourself sometimes. <laughs> and, and, um, yeah. yeah, so some of those, fortunately, some of that did get left in. And, um, you know, I'm sure by book number two, I'll have way more creative leeway. So we'll see. Yeah. I wrote about laughter and I did so quite seriously. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they want from a spiritual book. They want a serious <laughs> contemplation of laughter. Exactly. Yeah. There's not very many hilarious philosophers out there, um, but I look for them. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked this interview from the Commune podcast, then I think you'll love this video right here. Psychologists talk about these key techniques that humans have for regulating emotions that makes us different to kind of um, other animals. Uh, and one of the key ones is called cognitive reappraisal.